5. A flighty spirit usually carries men out of their place and calling. No doubt some servants of God receive a special calling from heaven to do extraordinary things. As in the case of Moses, Gideon, Phinehas, and others, they are, however, rare exceptions. And it is dangerous to assume that we have been given such an exceptional divine call when God most often issues his commissions in a more ordinary way, such as through his word. We may as well expect to be taught in an extraordinary way without the Bible as to expect to be called in an extraordinary way without the corroboration of God's word. When I see any who are miraculously gifted, as the prophets and the apostles were, then I shall believe the authenticity of the extraordinary calling they claim. Let us consider for a few moments why so many are carried out of their place and calling. The reason is not always the same. Well, sometimes it's a spirit of idleness. Men neglect what they should do, then are easily persuaded to meddle with what they have no business doing. The Christian who will not serve God in his own place will soon be found doing the devil's errand, putting his sickle into another's corn. The apostle states this quite plainly. They learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies, 1 Timothy 5, 13. Others abandon their assigned place because of a spirit of pride and discontent. Their calling may be low and humble, but their spirits are high and prideful. They make the mistake of trying to raise their calling to the proud level of their spirits rather than humbling their spirits to the level of their calling. In the case of Korah, it was not the work of the priest that he wanted so much as the honor which went with the position. As for Absalom, it was, it was not a zeal for justice that made his spirit strive for his father's crown, but rather greedy ambition that hid itself behind a zealous facade. Positions of prominence in the church and community are such fair flowers that proud spirits of every age have sought them for their own gardens. However, such flowers do not thrive well except in their proper soil. Another unsettled spirit that carries some out of their place is unbelief. This made Uzzah stretch forth his hand to steady the teetering ark. Since he was only a Levite, he had God's command not to touch the ark. But when the ark began to shake, the poor man's faith shook more. By fearing the fall of the ark, he fell to the ground himself. He had not learned a vital truth, and that is that God does not need our sin to shore up his glory, his truth, or his church. In some, the flighty spirit is misinformed zeal. Many think because they can do a thing, a preach, for example, that they may do it. Certainly the gifts of such saints need not be lost. The layman has a large field in which he may minister to his fellow man, even if he is not called to full-time ministry. But he is not to trample down the hedge which God has placed about the ministry and thus cause disorder in the church. According to Jewish law, one who set a hedge on fire and accidentally burned the corn growing in an adjacent field was required to make restitution. Though he did not mean to hurt the corn, his action was the reason the corn burned, and so he was responsible. Now, we've all seen private Christians who have taken upon themselves the work of a minister. I dare say most of them never intended to cause such a combustion in the church as generally results from this kind of insubordination. But because they have set fire to the hedge which God has put between the minister's calling and the people's, they are responsible for the damage. If we acknowledge the ministry to be a particular office in the church, which I think the word compels us to do, then we must agree the work of that office should be done only by one who is called to it. There are many in a country who could be statesmen, but only those who can show a letter of appointment are recognized as official ambassadors. 
Those who are not commissioned by God's call for ministerial work may speak truths as well as any, yet we observe that only the one who acts by virtue of his calling preaches with true authority. If you insist on preaching but do not have God's commission to the ministry, you are like one who joins his country's army on the battlefield and announces he's come to fight against the common enemy. And yet he stands by himself at the head of a troop that he has gathered and refuses to take orders from any of the officers or to let his troops join ranks with theirs. I question whether that man's service will do as much good against the enemy as his action does harm by distracting the entire army. We go on to another heading now. He was talking about standing. And this heading, number three, is stand, do not sleep. Standing is waking, watching posture. It's in the military. Stand to your arms means stay alert and watch. In some cases, it is death to a soldier to be found asleep. When he is assigned to guard duty, for instance, he is to watch so that the rest can sleep. Shirking his duty endangers the lives of the entire army, so he deserves his sentence of death. Watchfulness is more important for the Christian soldier than any other. In temporal battles, soldiers fight against men who need sleep the same as themselves, but the saint's enemy, Satan, is always awake and walking his rounds. Since the devil never sleeps, The Christian puts himself in grave danger by falling asleep spiritually, that is, by becoming secure and careless. Either the unregenerate part of his nature will betray him, or grace will not be alert to discover the enemy and prepare for the assault. Satan will be upon him before he is awake enough to draw his sword. You should be aware that the saint's sleeping time is Satan's prime tempting time. Even a fly dares to creep on a sleeping lion. Unless he wakes up, there's nothing to fear. The weakest temptation is strong enough to foil a Christian who is napping in security. While Samson slept, Delilah cut his locks. While Saul slept, his spear was taken from his side and he was none the wiser. A drunken Noah slept and his graceless son took pleasure in seeing his father's nakedness. Eutychus slept, nodded, and fell from the third loft and was taken up for dead. Thus the Christian, sleeping in false security, may be taken by surprise. He may lose much of his spiritual strength. He may be robbed of his spear or armor, his graces, I mean, or have his nakedness uncovered by graceless men and bring shame to his profession. Sleep steals upon the soul as quietly as it does on the body. The wise virgins fell asleep along with the foolish ones, though not so soundly. Take heed that you do not indulge yourself in laziness. Stir yourself to action, as we tell someone who is drowsy to stand up and walk around. Yield to idleness and sloth, and they will grow upon you. Busy yourself in your Christian duties, and spiritual drowsiness will flee. David first awakened his tongue to sing and his hand to play on the harp. Then his heart awakened also. I have heard that when the lion first wakes, he lashes himself with his tail to stir and rouse his courage. And then away he goes after his prey. We have reason enough to excite and provoke us to all the care and diligence possible. The next heading is why the Christian must remain wakeful. Why the Christian must remain wakeful. Number one, the Christian's work is too important and demanding to be done while half asleep or in a half-hearted fashion. If you've ever walked along the edge of a raging river or hiked to the crest of a steep hill, I doubt that you grew sleepy. As a Christian, your path is so narrow and the danger so great It calls for both a nimble eye to discern and a steady eye to direct. A sleepy eye can do neither. Examine any duty and you will find that it lies between two dangerous extremes. Faith, the great work of God, cuts its way between the mountain of presumption and the gulf of despair. 
Patience is the grace necessary to keep us from suffering a stroke of sleepy stupidity, which would deprive us of our senses, or from flying into a rage of discontent that would deprive us of our reason. Keeping a proper balance is essential. Any duty we perform for the cause of Christ takes us very near the enemy's quarters. Do not think you will pass by undetected. Your approach sounds an alarm, and Satan comes out immediately to oppose you. Thus it is necessary that you remain constantly watchful. Number two, watchfulness reaps advantages for the Christian in in three important ways. First, by watching, you frustrate Satan's intentions. Is it not worth watching to keep your house from being robbed? How much more worthwhile to prevent your heart from being invaded by the devil? Watch that you enter not into temptation, Jesus said. Getting your throat cut is a high price to pay for sleep even if the wound should finally heal. It's better to be watchful now and keep yourself from mischief than to sleep and be kept awake because of the wound you suffered for your negligence. David was in a state of spiritual slumber when he rose from his bed, walked upon the roof of his house, and cast his eye upon Bathsheba. He fell headlong into Satan's trap, bruising his spirit badly. And how many restless nights this wound brought to David, you may perceive by his own complaints of this sin, which is a theme of several mournful psalms. Second, it is by faithful watching that you best learn the dangers of sleeping. A sleeping man is not aware of his own snoring, nor of how he annoys and troubles others. But anyone who is awake is conscious of it. If you stay awake spiritually, you will surely see the improprieties of those professing Christians who do not watch their hearts. Let them serve as a warning to you not to fall prey to the same temptations. Sleep levels all men. The strongest is no safer than the weakest while they both slumber. A napping wise man and a sleeping fool are equally vulnerable. Likewise, spiritual sleep makes even the best of saints as vulnerable as any other man as long as the sleep prevails. Third, your watchfulness is an open invitation to the Lord himself to keep you company. And when he comes to you, the time will fly by in sweet communion. His revelations about the things of the Father's kingdom will keep you from envying sleepy Christians their seeming ease knowing they are missing the blessed fellowship that you enjoy. Would you not, if you love your soul more than your body, rather have David's songs than his sleep in the night? And is it not better to keep your soul awake and know Christ's comforting presence than to let it sleep and miss the Savior's visit? It is the watchful soul that Christ delights to be with, and to it he opens his heart. We do not choose to visit our friends while they are asleep. In fact, if we are with them and sense they are getting sleepy, we excuse ourselves and leave them free to retire. Christ does the same with his spouse. He withdraws from her until she is better awake and more fit to receive his love. Put a purse of gold into the hand of a sleepy man, and the next morning he will hardly remember what you gave him. A groggy Christian will not recognize the true value of Christ's gifts, nor remember to thank him properly for them. Therefore, God gives his special blessings to the wide-awake soul, not only to bless his child, but also that the child may bless him by speaking well of Christ for them.